Janelle Bakirova presents a series of discussions about the place of Kazakh culture in the global world. Meetings with prominent public figures, candid conversations, collisions of opinions, and discussions about the most important things. Hello, Edward. I'm very pleased to see you. You are a celebrity. You are a recognized artist, not only in our country, but around the world. And today, our talk is going to be the talk of two representatives of the cultural industry. I decided to invite Edward Kazarian because I am a big fan of his talent. We didn't know each other before, but whenever I see his huge, amazing works on the streets of the city, I can't help but think how beautiful they are. In addition, Edward has long become the legendary and iconic face of Kazakh culture. Edward. So what do you think about our cultural processes, about the future, about the global context, and about where is the place of our country in the world? Hello, Jania. Firstly, I must say that I am always very pleased to speak to you on any topic, and especially about culture. And we, like no one else, understand that there cannot be too much of culture. As a matter of fact, it is highly cultured people who are usually very critical of themselves and who can more accurately than others realize that there is still room for development. And this development should happen non-stop. On the other hand, let's say a person for whom culture is something distant will probably think that he is good as he is, he had enough. Exactly. You know, I am often asked the same question. How do viewers and listeners perceive your art in other countries? Which country do you like to perform in? How does people's perception differ? And it is usually assumed that there is one reaction in Kazakhstan, somewhere else in Europe, in Africa, or in Australia, it can be a different one. And somewhere else in the United States, it is the other one. As if there is some kind of difference in people's reception. What are your thoughts about it? How is your creativity? your exhibitions are perceived in different parts of the world. I think I have long ago realized that people perceive art everywhere. The same way? And they understand it the same way. For me, a very typical example was the exhibition in Edinburgh. It is very common for that public rather to tell him how they have understood his paintings. What they see in them. Yes. That is great. That is a chance for the artist to get some rest. Well, I'm kidding, of course. But really, they were coming up to me and were telling me what they saw in my work, and it was so amazing. I saw that they really understood everything. Exactly. Everyone understands everything. I also noticed that. Now, social networks have become very active, and sometimes the reaction to your concerts and posts can appear online at the speed of light. And when you read reviews, at some point, you realize that ordinary people, your viewers understand you even better than professionals, than art critics. We do not exist on our own. We exist for people. And this feedback is the most wonderful. And I began to notice that people, no matter what kind of work they do, they understand. They understand every single thing that art conveys. Now, Edward, please tell us. How you found yourself in this bizarre fairy tale world of yours? Did you create it yourself? Or are you a successor to some art movement? After all, it is known that there are old traditions associated with the creation of sculptural compositions of stone and metal in Armenia. In fact, I think, to some extent, every artist lives in his own, completely unique world. That is why he is somewhat naive, somewhat vulnerable, because he creates his own world that sometimes cannot be aligned with real life. There is one graphic picture. I still remember it very clearly. It depicts an artist in his room, and there is a battle, almost a war outside and still he sits and draws his model, completely calm. For him, this is the most important thing in the world. 
You mean he's not even aware of what is happening around him? Of course. For him, it is his work that matters more. Here's one more example. There was an Armenian artist, Martiros Saryan, who was during the Great Patriotic War, that he created a number of paintings depicting flowers. Therefore, yes, artists always live in their own world. But then again, it does not necessarily mean that this world is always completely different from the real world. It is rather a kind of embodiment of how the artist wants to communicate his thoughts to the world, maybe not even to the people themselves, but to the world, to the space. I saw many different works of Martiro Sarian in booklets, and I remember that there were many of his original works on the walls of the apartment of Tigran Alikhanov, my teacher in Moscow. It seemed to me that his whole apartment was filled with the works of Martiro Sarian. I remember those bright colors. Well, at least his style is somewhat recognizable to me. And have you ever experienced any mystical cases when you thought that something, some kind of image, idea, had come down to you from above? <laughs> To be honest, this happens all the time. All the time? Yes. So, are we some kind of magicians then? Or not necessarily magicians, but it looks like we have a connection with sublime matters. I don't think that we are magicians, but what we create is magical. It absolutely is. There were quite unusual moments in my life, like when, for instance, I was very nervous before the concert. I remember there was a concert in Karaganda two years ago. I had a completely new program, very complicated, and I had a big tour in Kazakhstan, and then in Europe. So I was worried more than ever. They were announcing me, listing all my ranks and titles, people were applauding. In general, Karaganda loves me very much. My concerts there are usually very successful. And suddenly, the host, who noticed how worried I was, came up to me and hugged me. And she is a religious woman, Orthodox Christian. And so she hugged me and I calmed down a little. And then a young girl, the deputy director of the Philharmonic Society, ran past and said, Jania Allah Jar Bolson, meaning, may Allah support you. And I suddenly realized, well, wow, these people shared their strength and support with me. So I walked on to the stage and thought, this cannot just vanish in vain, without consequences. Something special is about to happen to me. I started playing, and when I looked down at my hands, it felt as if my hands were playing by themselves. And I was sitting there, and I was afraid to frighten away this incredible feeling. I thought, what is it? What's happening? Oh my God, this is just amazing. My hands were playing the keys by themselves. I just watched them. I wasn't involved in the process. I wasn't doing anything myself, did not control it. I just sat there, thinking that I was present at some special magical moment of my life. And I tried not to frighten it away, not to lose it. And this has actually happened to me. Of course, some would say people of art are like children who believe in fairy tales. But this is true. People of art do believe that miracles happen to them, and those people who supported you. It is not just that we believe in it or that we just heard about it. We experience it. You realize that it wasn't just a coincidence, right? It was tremendous. Yes, I realized that. Edward, you have been living in Kazakhstan your whole life. So, do you think that Kazakh artists have some special style of their own? 
You know, this question is relevant not only for Kazakhstan, but also for any country, for any nation. For anyone in the world, national art and national traditions are a pure spring, to which sooner or later people return to get some ideas from. But again, here it is important not to just exploit old ideas and utilize already existing elements, but to rethink, to redesign them. Only then this spring will remain clear. The process of rethinking and redesigning should be permanent. Things we inherited from our ancestors are wonderful, but we need to constantly work on them, rethink them, and this is the only way to create new things. This is so interesting, what you are saying. After all, exactly the same things happen in music. It turns out that there are some universal laws of art that are common across all of its branches. Also, I believe that globalization affects artists unconsciously sometimes. You know, Edward, it is a shame, but I think I speak for many people of art here. Sometimes it happens that we know our own field really well, and at the same time, we are not very familiar with the other one. And you, as a very famous and bright representative of the creative field, what can you say about the training of sculptors in Kazakhstan? How many of them do we have? Is this a niche movement? How traditional is this movement for our art? I mean, more or less, we know our artists, but we don't know our sculptors. And, for example, when press releases are coming from the Kasteyev State Museum of Arts, sculpture exhibitions are very rare among numerous events that they hold. What is really happening with this art in our country? Are you the one and only? Well, sculpture art has always been a bit underrepresented, it is to some extent. Is it like a double bass or trombone in music? Something that is not very mainstream? I don't know. I mean, yeah, there might be something in common. And even if we consider collectors, paintings, for example, are collected by quite a few. But if a person says that he collects sculpture, this is a completely different thing. If we look at Western collectors who collect sculpture, we will see a different attitude towards them. They are considered more serious collectors. They are considered as someone who shares the same values. Yes, exactly. And this opinion is not unique to the sculptures themselves. It is the opinion of gallery owners as well. Because, after all, there are not so many people who collect sculptures. Because sculpture is more difficult to perceive and to exhibit. The sculpture itself, as a branch of art, is more complex. But if we talk about the Kasteyev Museum, then we should mention that just this year, they hosted a whole series of interesting sculpture projects. Therefore, it still seems to me that the art of sculpture is actively developing in Kazakhstan now. There are certain challenges to it, of course. After all, preparing for a sculpture exhibition is always demanding physically, especially if it is an international project. To transport a sculpture, for instance? Yes, it is always difficult, quite expensive and energy-intensive. Last year, in autumn, I had to deal with the transportation of my works. I have a whole collection of my works in France, about 40 works. They were stored in Monaco for some time, but I had an exhibition planned in Paris, so I had to transport 10 of my sculptures. By yourself? Which I did, but it wasn't possible to transport them back, so I left them at my friend's place. In Paris? In Fontainebleau. And now they will move one of these works to the exhibition, which will take place in our embassy, in the Embassy of Kazakhstan in France. One of my big works will be exhibited there. So, as Ostap Bender used to say, chairs were spreading away like cockroaches. And I understand that to collect all of my works back is going to be another challenge. Is it because of their weight and size? Yes, both of these parameters are important, and also sculptures need to be transported in a special way. I remember one of my first French exhibitions, I was so naive that I decided to sew special bags for large ceramic sculptures. To make it convenient to carry. Yes, and I had two bags with sculptures on each of my shoulders. One was here, the other was there. And for some reason, I was completely naive to check them in before the flight. I do not know what I was thinking then, probably thought that they would be treated with the same care I treated them. But when we landed at Charles de Gaulle Airport, I saw that the luggage was coming on the escalator and then falling down to the belt. 
And when my sculptures appeared there along with my suitcases, I realized that I had made a mistake. They were all broken? Yes, the ceramics were shattered. Edward, you were probably the first artist to expand your creativity and go beyond the exhibition halls when your works started to be exhibited in urban spaces. To be honest, your works would always catch my eye. I always thought they were beautiful, but for quite some time, I had no idea that they belonged to you. So tell me, what is happening to the world? Is this some kind of democratization? Why does art conquer new spaces? In fact, to a certain extent, this trend has existed for a long time. But due to some kind of dictatorship from above, there were a number of restrictions, if you allow me to say so. But personally, as a sculptor, I always considered the urban environment as a museum, exposition or gallery. Independent artwork should appear in these spaces. And when I say independent, I mean the ones that are not dedicated to any occasion. I'm not saying that there should be no monuments. They should exist, but in total their percentage should not exceed 3 or 5 percent of the overall number of artworks that we see in the city. Otherwise it will look like we've come to visit a gallery or a museum. There are going to be only busts around us, or only portraits. We'll get bored right away. It does seem boring, indeed. Absolutely. And we do not want this. A city is the environment in which we live. It is free and we want to feel free in it. We do not want anything to be imposed on us. We want to see independent works. Unfortunately, we do not have the opportunity to visit the museum on a daily basis, or gallery twice a day, and so on and so forth. But if we, when moving around the city, we'll be able to see five to ten works of art, even briefly. It will be amazing. Yes. And they will inspire us, energize us, elevate our mood. It will develop our creativity a little. And this is not to say about children who, by definition, must see good and creative things all the time. And it is the same with music, I believe. And do you know how people react to your works? Has it ever happened that you were standing and watching when your installation was photographed, when someone climbed it or just carefully examined? Do you have such an experience? Well, actually, this is quite an interesting moment. I always carefully watch how children look at my work. In general, the reaction of people is different, but it should be different. Some people like my work, some dislike them, some feel connected to it, others don't. Another thing is that we must be able to calmly perceive things we do not like. We should not take them aggressively. But then again, this is the case if we talk about high-quality work. There's always a clear interaction. Indeed, us artists want to be treated objectively, but people also have the right to see worthy works of art. What can you tell me about this popular opinion, when people believe that if an artist is commercially successful, then this means that his art is not good, and that the real creator, he is supposed to be poor, deprived of many things, that he is deep, and at the same time no one gets him, and there is this conflict between the commercially successful and the so-called true spiritual artist. What do you think about it? Well, it seems to me that any artist is doomed to experience all kinds of pressure that will affect his art. It can be poverty, misery, poor reception, it can be success, glory or wealth. And what will eventually break him remains a big question. But the artist should always have a chance to express himself. Why? Because he somehow represents investment. He is the property of the state. There is an artist and there is raw material who does not possess any value yet. But when the artist creates something astonishing out of this material, it will result in cultural and sometimes material value. And this will entail an indirect positive impact on the culture of the whole country. And it seems to me that if the country is dominated by a cultural and educated population, has more chances to reach that bright future that we all strive for. Do you consider yourself a master? 
I have no idea. The more I work, the more I ask myself, am I an artist at all or not? I think in order not to become arrogant, any creative person must ask himself this question. Thank you very much, Edward. I hope we will meet again like this and talk. Thank you so much, Jania. Our conversations always inspire me, and I am sure they will be reflected in my future works in one way or another. Oh, how nice! Thank you.